Oh, okay, that's good, bad, or indifferent. I don't know. This lady over here in the white dress, I don't remember her. Because, you know, when people are wearing masks, it's hard enough to recognize people, right? So uh, she'll, uh, every time I ask this, and it's not every time. Once in a while, I ask a question of someone, are you new? Is this the first time you've been here? No, I've been a member for 18 years. <laughs> so, so you're always hesitant to ask, but uh, uh, I'm, you're new. Yes. And where are you from? Oh, wow, we got somebody from California. Yes. Huh. We actually eat out, uh, eat indoors now in, in restaurants. Uh, I, mean, I know that's sort of strange for California, right? But uh, uh, it's a... Uh, oh, is it? You just can't eat indoors. They, they actually build spots outside of the building, outside the front door, that are um, like a few tables. Yeah. Well, that's pretty much with us, wouldn't you say? As far as church goes, we, there is a difference in members, if you've noticed. We don't have quite as many. And that's a choice situation when people may not feel comfortable. I'm going to ask you a question. It has nothing to do with the lesson. However, it might bring peace, which is part of the lesson. And that is, how many have been vaccinated? Anybody here? You got one back there. And, okay. Nobody else? Beverly, come on. You haven't been vaccinated? Oh, you're too young. You're only 35. <laughs> I know. Registration's the worst part. Once you get that part done, it's okay. So I have been vaccinated once. And next week, I'll get my second one. So uh, anyway, there is, there is some value to being over 75. <laughs> it's, it's the only one I can think of right now, but I'm sure there's others. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, hopefully we have a nice group here today. We're going to talk about a topic of peace and uh, something that we're lacking in this world. And uh, so was Isaiah in his day. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Our Father, we come boldly and confident to the throne of grace this morning, giving thanks that we can be here, that we can study your word, how wonderful it is to share the word with one another as we gain our relationship with you as well as with others. And we pray this morning as we talk about this subject of peace. And it was because of Jesus that we have the opportunity to have peace with you. So we ask for your presence, for the Holy Spirit to be with us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to take you back to 1952. And looking at the group here, most of you were probably adults <laughs> in 1950. Anybody remember 1952? That was a good year. Great year, unless you were in Korea. I, I was in Loma Linda. Loma Linda. Anybody remember? Two years. Two years in Loma Linda. Uh, can you remember where you were in 1952? I was born in 53. <laughs> okay, well, I'm getting older by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what happened. My folks uh, were uh, not highly educated and um, didn't make a lot of money in their jobs. And my dad was a custodian. We lived out in the country and at a little uh, country school. And he uh, basically took care of that school. And my mother was a nurse's aide uh, and so forth. And, uh, and she was possibly at home, too, because we had four kids. And so one day, and, and we didn't have a lot of money, but we thought we were okay. Uh, Dad brought home a TV. It was a 17-inch Admiral. And, uh, you know, TVs back in those days had a huge cabinet and, uh, in essence, had a small screen. Right? So you had a huge cabinet and this little teeny screen. So... I always wondered, you know, we got that TV set. Mom said there's a restricted to it because Dad liked to watch Roy Rogers, and Mom said no shooting in the house and so forth. So that took care of Roy Rogers uh, and so forth. So we had to watch only certain programs. And so she screened that, and now we were not Christian people. 
My folks rarely ever attended church and so forth. But there were certain guidelines, things you just didn't do. And so when we brought this TV set into our house, we had three programs we could watch. Lawrence Welk. Anybody know who Lawrence Welk is? Okay, a program called Mr. Peepers, uh, which today would be a bad title for anything, but in this case, it was about a school teacher. Uh, anybody remember that? No, okay. And there was one other program, if I remember. Oh, I can't even remember what it was. Must not have been that good. And so, but that was it. And I always thought, how did Seventh-day Adventists react to the advent of television? How many of you here are lifelong Adventists? Ooh, most of you. How did the Adventist world react to the introduction of television? Remember? Pud? Anybody know? Was there any reaction? Yes. Didn't want you to have it. Okay. We're buying kids from the movies, but we got the TV on for four hours every day, right? Uh, maybe that was the thing, you know. I always wondered how they reacted to that. Do you think TV's had quite an emphasis on our society over the years? Especially during the pandemic. Now, there's a study that said that people increased viewers' time on television during this pandemic by three hours a day and so forth. Well, we have mass media, or social media. We are constantly bombarded by our culture through mass media. Would you agree with that? So that brings us to Isaiah's situation as we study the last part of Isaiah 8, 9, try to get to Isaiah 11. And the topic here is peace. So, if you look at your lesson today, and... Uh, talks about a situation of Robert Oppenheimer, and I did a study, a biography on him many years ago, who kind of led out in the, the creation of the atomic bomb. And in your lesson, it talks about that he was inquired of anything that we could do or any defense against the nuclear bomb. And it said he paused and said there's only one thing, and that was peace is the only thing that we can do to defend ourselves against nuclear weapons. And he was pretty much right, was he not? Although we haven't had peace since the development of the bomb in 1945, uh, the point is, is that since the United States has utilized it in a broad way in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, it hasn't been used, thank goodness, right? So let's talk about peace. And if we can, um, the lesson says that peace is elusive. Any particular reason why it is? That in our history, peace has been an elusive thing, an elusive item, something you can't purchase, something that's hard to acquire. And in the world that we live today, why is that the case? Okay. All right. That's a good point, Bob. It's not a natural thing to be at peace, not only with God, but with others. Is that true? So what would motivate that? Now, Bob kind of addresses this because we're sinful, but sinful means we are... Who's most important in our life as sinful beings? We are. My ideas, my way of doing things, right? All of those. Okay, so we lack peace. So let's go to Isaiah's day, and it's the last part of Isaiah chapter 8 that we want to look at. And uh, we're going to start with 8.17, but before we do that, you've heard of the man Buddha from India, uh, and so forth, a great philosopher and so forth, a religious leader. And uh, said one day he had this huge bucket of water and he had taken that water from a, kind of a muddy river nearby, and he had his disciples standing beside him. And they both were looking into the water, and Buddha said to him this. 
he says, see what you did to make the water clean. You let it be, and the mud settled down on its own, and you got clear water. Your mind is like that. Having peace of mind is not a strenuous job. It's an effortless, effortless process. That's what Buddha said. Is that the case for the Christian? Is peace an effortless process in our lives? How would you respond to that? That for the Christian, peace is a natural thing. There's nothing to a process of that. It's just there. Is that true or not? We're going to address that today. Okay? How important peace is in our life. And so forth. But I'm interested how you would answer that. If somebody was to come up to you and say, well, as a Christian, peace is an automatic thing. That's a loaded question. Is that a true statement or is it false? Okay, we got one here that says it's a false statement. You want to elaborate on that at all, Bob? Okay. So you've got to put some effort into it to acquire it. Okay. You know, it's interesting. Uh, and Bob was saying that since we're sinful, peace is not an attribute of a sinful person. Not an attribute of you and I. In fact, it's a very difficult thing to accomplish. And so forth. So, as we look at Isaiah, and we look at our own world, and... Isaiah, and I'll just go to Isaiah 8, 17, and then we'll come back to this. Here's what it says. I will wait for the Lord. Use your Bibles today, because we're going to use this quite a bit. 8, 17. He says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. So what he's saying here, he said, you know, God is looking at the northern kingdom. He's looking at the southern kingdom. And he is about ready to do nothing with them. They have been disobedient. We're going to talk about some of the things they did and so forth. Their culture invaded their relationship with God. Do you think our culture today is a threat to our relationship with God? How can we take Isaiah's day and mold it into ours so that we can learn from what those people went through, are we as apt to be like them? Is culture a danger? Do you see culture as a good thing, a bad thing? That's number one. And number two is, how does culture affect us as Christians? How should we deal with it? I'm going to give you a couple examples in a minute. Anyone? Okay, let's do a show of hands. Is culture a bad thing with regard to being a Christian. Okay, we got a few say no. Okay, all right, let's go from that premise. Is there certain things in our culture that can contribute to hooting our relationship with God? Would you agree with that? Okay, now, how do we make, how do we make a decision that there are certain things that go on in the world is something that we do not want to partake of as Christians. Because it was this culture, and it was a religious culture as well, that invaded the relationship to God for the Israelites as well for the people of Judea. And that's why, and they were doing all kinds of things. Let's see what they were doing real quick. We'll try to mold this a little bit. And it says here, we'll talk about Ahaz because in Isaiah 8, this was during the time of Ahaz, a very bad king, about 434 BC, excuse me, 734 BC. It says when Ahaz was 20 years old, he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshiping the Baals. False worship. False worship. The worship of the nations around them invaded the worship 
okay, of the Israelites, of Israel and Judea. So it puts a lot of emphasis on false worship. Now, we look at that and they say, well, what does that mean? Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, and correct me if I'm wrong, about other Christian groups. Did you know that? Now, if you think about Matthew 24, where would I get a statement like that? When you think of someone in Matthew 24, he warned us against other professing Christians. What did he say? Many confessing Christ, or many will come in my name. And he made relationship to the second coming. Many will say, I'm here, I'm in the inner rooms. But as the lightning comes out of the east and unto the west, so shall what? The coming of the Son of Man be. He took the second coming, that event, and tied that to false worship. Did he not? Is that a true statement? So we look at our culture and we say, well, wait a minute. Let's see what Ahaz did, and then we'll come back to that. Let's finish this. He burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, and he sacrificed his children. Can you imagine that? Now, the reason that wouldn't be a temptation to us is because even the heathen don't do that. Not now. But back then, it was common. Is it possible to rub shoulders with evil to a point where it becomes okay? What do you think? Is that a cultural problem? Is we rub shoulders through mass media with evil and all of a sudden it doesn't look so evil because we see it all the time and we become comfortable with it. What do you think? All right, um, give you a couple examples as we go on. And uh, back, back to 817 again. Isaiah was saying, you know what? God has turned his back on Israel and uh, Judea. He'd been punished time and time again because he loved them and wanted to bring them back. But the day was coming, in fact, just three years from that time in Isaiah 8 or 9, Assyria invaded the northern kingdom and conquered it and took all of those individuals to Assyria. The ten lost tribes, as we say. There were only two left, Benjamin and Judea. And they fell to the Babylonians 140 years, 40 years later. Due to the cultural influence and their worship with God, and it separated them. Okay. Um, this is a statement from the NIV commentary. It says, pride made the people of Israel think they would recover and rebuild in their own strength. And that comes from Isaiah 9, 8 through 10. You got your Bible, why don't you turn to that? Isaiah 9, 8 through 10. Let's take a look at that, if you find it. I'm reading out of the NIV, and it says this. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. Now, here it's talking predominantly about the northern kingdom, but this ultimately would happen to Judea as well. So he goes on to say, all the people know it, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say with arrogance and pride of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we'll rebuild them. Pardon? Okay. And dress stone, the fig trees have fell, but we'll replace them with cedar. They realized they had a spiritual problem. How did they decide, based upon those texts, they were going to deal with them? Anybody? They were saying, we'll take care of that. We'll use our ideas. We'll use our thoughts. We'll do what we think is best. Who did they not consult with? They didn't consult with God. And do you remember Ahaz when he was threatened by Israel and Syria that they were going to invade him because they wanted him to participate with them in defense of Assyria? But he had other ideas. Rather than, because Isaiah had came to him 
and said, look, don't worry about the northern kingdom. Don't worry about Syria. This is not going to happen. They are not going to invade your country. Instead, what does he do? He goes to Assyria, because he knows it's the stronger of all the nations, and he makes a deal with the king. Okay? And we know the end result of that. And so, in the NIV, it says this. Pride made the people of Israel think they would recover and rebuild in their own strength. Even though God was the one who made the people of Israel a great nation and gave them the land they occupied, the people put their trust in themselves and their own cleverness and their own resources. All right. How many of you have been on boards? Church boards? Committees? Right? Okay, and we got all kinds of issues that come up in those things. And too many times, isn't it true that maybe we sometimes proceed without prayer or earnest prayer? And some of us may be great business people. We may have other abilities and so forth that we take those and use those as solutions to the problems we face rather than diligently laying them before God to lead us. Would you agree? Okay, so they had that problem then. I think we could acknowledge we have that problem now, right? And you know, during the time of Josiah, he was a good king and one of the first. That's so when Isaiah actually got his proclamation from God to be a prophet. The land's prosperous then. But it said that the people became lax. We cannot handle prosperity. Apparently, right? We can become lax, become comfortable, like the church of Laodicea, right? We're comfortable. Not hot, not cold. Go to church, go to midweek service. You go through the motions and so forth. But many of our works are self-induced. And number two is, we really don't have any mission. In essence, we are Christians from the perspective that we think we're following everything we should follow, but at the same time, we're really following our own will. We're all doing our own thing. So getting back to the culture thing, when I was first, uh, we, Kill and I were first baptized as Seventh-day Adventist. I think I've told you her history, being a Christian all well, before that anyway, I was not. And uh, I was working for a company called Commercial Credit. They were what we call an industrial loan company. And every Christmas, they had a Christmas party. We had been baptized in November, and uh, we were very committed. And uh, we did all kinds of things. And we did it just because that was probably the thing to do. We were learning. And so they had this big Christmas party. So what do you think they do at business or company Christmas parties? Well, they usually have food, usually a dinner. They have certain events, uh, along with alcohol and other things. And so Carol and I said, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't go. So I, uh, our pastor came in on our seventh month of Bible studies uh, and so forth. And I, I told him, uh, you know, I guess we're not going to go to the Christmas party. So why not? I said, well, pastor, you know, the language isn't always the best. The stories they tell aren't so great. I said, you know, they drink alcohol. There's other things going on. And uh, he said, you should go. You should be there. And I thought, well, wait a minute. That doesn't make any sense. I, why would I be there? He said, you need to be there. Because you need to show them that you're not better than they are. You don't have to drink. You don't have to tell those jokes. You don't have to do anything. You pray for God to give you leading. You will gain more from that experience than you will from that. Now, you may disagree with that counsel, but I have found that is good counsel as over the many, many years since then and so forth. And uh, Sabbath issues. I told a story about my first Sabbath experience. You remember that, Robert? And so though you haven't, it was quite a dramatic thing for me for Sabbath, the fact of losing my job. Well, many years later, 
uh, when I had a tremendous victory and how God will lead even when we are weak. I had went to a meeting and I was a general manager for a large laboratory company and we had a meeting that was scheduled for Wednesday, Thursday and would end on Friday. Well, Friday morning came and we were way behind and so they announced to the group, we are going to continue through Saturday. And the vice president of marketing knew me, because I think that's why he made this statement. He said, and we expect everybody to be there. There are no exceptions. Now, if that would have been 10 years before, as a new believer, I'd been trembling in my shoes. But because I learned from that experience before that God does intervene, I had confidence that he would work this out. I was not worried. And so I went to the VP's assistant and I said, look, I have to leave at noon on Friday and so forth and I can't stay. He said, Chuck, you'd better stay. Because I will tell you that Mr. Fine, who is the vice president, will probably fire you. And I said, well, I said, you know, it's unfortunate, but I said, you know what? It's the Lord's day, and he has to take priority. And so that got back to Mr. Fine. And so when we came uh, back from a break at 10 o'clock, he said, you know, we're making such great progress that we're going to end at noon. Are you telling me the Lord just has blessed like that many times? It may not happen to you exactly that way, but how he leads us when we want to do his will and so forth. And sometimes we don't have enough strength to do it. We are afraid. We're fearful. What will others think? And all of those kind of things have been through that, and so have you. But when he guides us through and we follow him and he gives us the power and we see what he can do, what does it give us? Confidence. So when the next event comes, we're ready for it. Based upon not your experience, based upon my experience, right? So, this idea that Isaiah was saying, he said, you know what, despite what's transpiring, I will trust in him. What was Isaiah thinking about? And of course, we have Isaiah 9. When he says, I trust in him, what is he thinking with the way it looked right then that Israel was going to fall, Judea was in terrible shape, and so forth. There were raids on their nation. Uh, it didn't look good. The people were just completely out of bounds, wickedness of all kinds, and so forth. And Isaiah was just a spokes guy. He was just telling the people what God told him, right? So, what was he, he think he was looking for? If you've studied that lesson, he looked at Isaiah 9. We're going to get to that in a minute. There was an event. There was something that was coming that would bring harmony with the people and would bring peace. What was it? If you go to Isaiah 9, what was it? Let's go to Isaiah 9. Let's look at verse 1 and then verse 6 and 7. Verse 1. Nevertheless, now if you go back to Isaiah 8, 17 to the end of the chapter, it tells you about Isaiah, that he's going to trust in God. And then it goes to all the various issues that are going to happen to both Israel primarily, but later Israel, uh, Judea. But then it says, nevertheless, in other words, since all, even though these things are happening, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the, and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. Jesus brings up that very text in the New Testament. So, what was he pointing to? Verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. 
and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace, of peace, of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over the kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. All right. So, when Isaiah said, I have trust, what was he looking to? As we see those texts. And so that's going to help us, I think, in the world we live today. What was he looking for? In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, it says they didn't receive the reward. They had already died. What were they looking for? The Messiah, right? Now, I want to ask you something. When Isaiah made that statement, 817, he said, I'll trust in God. Well, how long did he have to wait? When that message was given in, De in Isaiah 8, that was 700 plus years before Christ came. 700 years. And the promise was what the people would come back, especially from the northern kingdom, and especially Galilee. We'll come back to that in a minute. It mentions specifically the area of Galilee. Why is that? Why did it mention that area specifically? Because ultimately, both kingdoms fell. Where did Jesus come from? Where did Jesus come from? What was his hometown? Anybody know? Where were those kids at? <laughs> Capernaum, right? He lived in Capernaum. That was his hometown. Now, if you take the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you will find, as you read those texts, that it appears that Jesus spent most of his time in Galilee. But if you go to the book of John... It appears that, well, it mentions Jesus going to Jerusalem once in the three Gospels, but in the Gospel of John, seven times. It seems in John that Jesus spent more time in Judea. Have you gotten ever read that? As you go through the scriptures, ever read that? Got that feeling. You seem like you're spending all this time in Galilee. But then you read the book of John, and you see that he spent, probably one of the reasons is John basically spends most of its time in the latter days of Jesus' life, right? Well, the gospel start from the beginning. And so, this Messiah would be someone who comes from Galilee. Although born in Bethlehem, in Judea, he lived in Nazareth. And in essence, he was in Galilee all of his life until he was time to enter the end of the ministry. And so, It tells us this, in Matthew 4, verses 12 through 25, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee, he, leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. The same thing that Isaiah was talking about, is those people be especially blessed. Why? Because Jesus was there. And also, number two, you must remember when the Assyrians invaded Israel, one of the first places to fall was the area of Galilee. Those people were the first ones taken captive. And so they would be the ones that would be especially blessed by Jesus' presence, right? So what are we trying to say here? It appears that Isaiah's hope was the fact that he believed in a Messiah that would come and make things right. Right? And isn't that our hope? Let me ask you this. And we've made references before. Have you heard the statement, even if there was no second coming in our age, I'd still live the Christian life? How many of you would say that? Hey, we got some lawns, people. How many wouldn't say that? <laughs> a 
So what are you trying to say, Chuck? I, what, I'd rather be a rebel rouser? <laughs> you know what Paul says? Paul answers that question in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There was a group of people, kind of like the Sadducees, who taught that there is no resurrection, and they were Christians. Let me ask you something. If that was true, if there is no resurrection, would your life change? Think about it. If there was no resurrection, this is it. When they put you in the ground, or whatever they do with you, that's it for you. It's over. It's done. Would you be different? Would your values, would your ideas of things be different than they are now? I know you're probably nervous about saying yes, because they might put you on the slipping away category and you can visit some of the pastor. But let me tell you what Paul says. He said, if there is no resurrection, we are pitied above all men. So what do you think Paul's answer was with that? He said, if you're going to live that life and there's no resurrection, forget it. That's what he's saying. You've been misled. You've been deceived. You've been a follower of James Jones. So Isaiah believed in the Messiah and his coming. And his actions showed that. So my question to you is, does the reward of being tied to Jesus provide incentive for us to want to be a true follower of Jesus? Is that one of the real motivators of our faith, would you say? Now, saying that, if that's the case, I'm going to ask you a tough question, a hard one. As a church today, and I'm talking about our church as a whole, not just here, the attitude is today that we are a church who has lost its mission. We are a church that's lost its vision. We are a church that gathers together smaller in number than before, but no vision. And where there is no vision, what's the rest of it? When there is no vision, there is no action. You know, when Carol and I were baptized, I go back and I think about this. I've never forgotten this, and some have been in my class have heard this before. We were so excited. You remember that? When you first became a Christian, man, I mean, you were just dancing on, on, you know, on toes. We were so excited. We didn't know a lot, but we were excited and so forth. And I remember being in the church, and one of the elders came up to me, and we were talking. And I said, you know, this is such a wonderful experience. I'm so glad I'm in this. And, uh, you know, Kill and I want to be followers of Jesus, want to do his thing. And you know what he told me? He said, Chuck, that'll go away after a while. That's what he said. That'll go away. It's kind of like puppy love. Remember we used to tell that when we were kids? You got first date, that first girl. Oh, that's just puppy love. That's exactly what he was saying. That's just puppy love. It'll go away. I've never forgotten that. And I thought, what would make a person say that? I think he was being honest with me. I don't think he was telling me a lie. He was being very upfront. That was his experience. And so forth. And so Isaiah had an issue maybe like we have. Is that the people were going the wrong direction. And we find out that the wrong direction is that they were trusting in other things other than God. It's that simple. Right? So... But Isaiah said, you know what? Regardless of the situation, I trust God to get us through. Now, why would he make that statement? 
What motivated him to say that? I mean, why can't you just care less? What was it about him that he said, I trust in God in this? How do we gain trust? How do we have a kind of trust that stays faithful? We just talked about it, didn't we? In our experiences in life, we see God doing things for us. You might have a meeting you have to go to. It's going to be a tough meeting. Maybe the finances aren't real well in your business. Maybe there's some other issues. And you get on your knees and say, Lord, I have an issue with this. I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to handle this. I'm afraid, and I don't know how we're going to deal with this. And you pray, and you get up. You go into that meeting, and it's entirely different than how you thought it would go. And there's little things like that. And you see God was working. He got me through it. Isn't that his promise? He doesn't take us out of the meeting, but he walks through us in the meeting. Isn't that right? Isaiah's experience must have been of one who had seen God working in his life, and he could trust him in all things. That's what I would like to be today. How about you? So what's the solution? God was calling his people back to true worship. And if we think of the three angels' message, isn't that a call back to true worship? And as we look at the three angels' message, what's the first thing that it addresses? The first thing. Not the mark of the beast. Not taking its mark in your hand or your your head. The primary first part of the three angels' message is to accept Jesus as your Savior and to walk with him and love him from the beginning and have it grow all the way through. And as we go through these life experiences, right, they're tough and they're difficult. The reason sometimes they're there is a good thing because it depend- we need to see God in action in our lives. Don't you agree with that? I want to see him. And I cannot live off of somebody else's experience. Is that true? I want to live the life that he wants me to live, and I know that I fall short. One guy says, well, how can we stop being proud? Stop comparing your people with other people, and if you need to compare, compare with Jesus. You'll be humble enough after you're done, right? You agree? That's what the people didn't do. They started depending on other things. It was popular to bring in things from others. Other nations, and especially from a worship perspective, they brought things in and fed it into their church, fed it into their beliefs, and kept some of God's beliefs. And that is dangerous, according to the word we have today. All right, enough of that. Let's see. I want to go, I love this verse 6 and 7. We talked a little bit about the synoptic gospels. And let's, how much time do we have? Not much. Okay, let's try this. For a child is born. Now, this is, again, the prophecy of Isaiah, that a Messiah would come. And he was talking about the first, but as we go further into Isaiah, he's also talking about the second. But he says, this Messiah is going to come, and he is going to be a child is born. What is significant about the fact that a child is born when it comes to the Messiah? A child is born... What is, what is valuable in that statement? And maybe just absolutely essential. God became man. You ever said, I wonder, and I used to teach juniors and so on. Those kids will ask questions they're not supposed to ask. <laughs> you know, us, we're a little more sophisticated. They always ask these questions. Well, what would Jesus do if he was human? You know what? We got an example, right? How would God act as a human being in his righteousness and in his perfection? How would he act? What would he be like? Okay? The fact that God became flesh. Now, let me ask you this. If you remember your history and you study the seven churches, there was a group of people called Gnostics, Gnosticism. And they taught this. 
And, and this is why this is so important. A child, a son will be born. They believed that Jesus w- could not be in the flesh because flesh is evil. So when Jesus was in the flesh, he really wasn't God. There's only certain times, like the transfiguration or whatever, when he was God. But when he was human, living in a human body, no. And that's why many Gnostics believed, go ahead and do what you want. Do anything you want. It's all tree doesn't make any difference because you're in the flesh. It's wicked. It doesn't make any difference. And they taught that. We're told in Revelation, as well as in the book of the Gospels, is that, and Paul is very strong about this, is that those who don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh is antichrist. It means they are against Christ. If you don't believe that God came in the flesh and was God in the flesh, you're antichrist. Why is that so important? I wish we could spend three Sabbaths on this because there's so much to this. If Jesus did not come in the flesh, you and I could not be saved. True or false? Why did he have to come in the flesh? Why did he have to become a second Adam? Let's think about that. Because you see, the payment for sin comes back to Adam, doesn't it? Where did sin come from? Now we know it came from Satan. But from a human race perspective, where did sin come from? Adam, right? Now let me ask you this. It's kind of like the uh, COVID-19 virus, only was. When Adam sinned, the Bible said sin spread to how many people? All people. You were born without a choice about your nature. So now God has a dilemma here. He had to prove that Adam could live the perfect life. And it had to be done in the flesh. That's why it could, one of the reasons it could be on an angel. God had to make, bring Jesus in, the incarnate, and be born of a woman and conceived by the Holy Spirit in order for the sacrifice to work. And then he had to live a life as a second Adam, right? And we get an example then what God would be like if he was a human being. Jesus did not have the perpetual or the, I won't call it ability, but did not have the bent to sin like we have. People say, well, he was exactly like us. No, he was not. He was not exactly like us. Because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, as some of you were, and I don't think you were. So he was God and man. Sin was distasteful to him from the very beginning. For us, it's tasteful. For him, it was not. And so he had to come as a human being. He had to die as a human being in order to pay for Adam's sin. And because of that, righteousness spread to how many men? All men, the Bible says. In other words, your sins and every sin of anybody who has ever lived or will live in the future... Their sins have been paid for, not forgiven. Paid for, because God, when he gives a gift, wants to make sure you accept it, right? And so forth. So isn't that important when he says, a son was born? It was essential for our salvation that Jesus come as a human being. Well, we're not going to get through all of this and so forth, but as you go through and use some commentaries and go through the description of the Messiah as it's given in Isaiah 9, 6. It will give you hope, it will give you strength, it will give you confidence. And I'm going to stop, it's five minutes. Is there any questions? I know we kind of ran through that a little bit. I want to encourage you as you study. This Isaiah is a great book. And we live in a tough age, folks, we really do. Uh, There's a lot of discouragement, we went through a lot this last year. And things aren't going to get easier. The Bible tells us things are going to get tougher. But... The Bible says this, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And peace, Shiloh, basically means that we have things right with God. Maybe no peace around us, but we have peace with God because we trust in what he has told us. 
Peace comes by faith in Christ. And if we really believe that and accept that we have him as our Father, and Jesus was called the Eternal Father, we'll get to that, couldn't get to that today. We can have faith in him, regardless of where you are and what you've done spiritually. And then God will walk us through where he wants us to be and help us to mature if we diligently take time with him. And that, I think, is the problem of our church today. We are not a church of the Bible today. Very few people take time to study their Bibles and pray. And I tell you, that is a death warrant for all of us. We need to take time for him. Whether it's morning, wherever it is, you take, we, we need to take time with him. We do that and we get the habit of what we'll, the Bible will teach us so many things and help us to be the person God wants us to be. Wouldn't you agree? Well, thank you very much. And let's have prayer. Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and his love. Uh, we give thanks for people like Isaiah and Jeremiah had a difficult time to try to bring the people back through your counsel. Uh, we know we're sinners. We know there are things in our lives that we can improve. But we want to make sure that we have that intimate relationship. We can see you working in our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you.